Okay, we'd like to say a special thank you to our career and technical education and fine arts departments over at the high school, Mr. Bill Crawford and his culinary art students. Mrs. Cynthia, Whip, Ms. Cynthia Whipple and our showbiz national anthem song and the other song that they performed. Mr. Marshall Pratt and the orchestra students and Jerry Butler with his video production team. Special thank you to Mel West and the city of Sholo for your assistance and expertise in recording these proceedings. Mrs. Tracy Johnson for our, for, in our photography department and our talented group of students from Sholo High School. Thank you so much. I'd like to introduce you to our school board members. Our school board president is Ms. Stacy Anderson. You want to stand up so everybody give a wave so we can see you? All right. Brent Clark, vice president. Amy Trugraskis, clerk. And our two members, John Larson and Daryl Perkins. And our board, super in, board and superintendent secretary, Brandy Gray. Our administrative staff will go with the youngest, or not the youngest, but the newest member of our admin team, Debbie Hall, principal at Whipple Ranch Elementary. <laughs> at Linden Elementary, the principal is Charlotte Crossgray. Nicholas Homestead, Mr. Kevin Hall. Sholo Junior High Principal, Mrs. Becky Clark. Sholo High School Principal, Mr. Ben Marchant. The Director of Special Services, Mrs. Beth Marsh. Director of Technology, Mr. Hal Clark. And our Business Manager, Mr. Greg Schubert. Director of Food Services, Mr. Jeff Houston. <laughs> Director of Curriculum and Federal Programs, Ms. Jamie Ramsey. <laughs> Director of Maintenance and Transportation, Maintenance and Transportation, Mr. Sean West. <laughs> and he isn't here today, but to our Director of CTE and White Mountain Institute, Dr. Brian Taylor. <laughs> our Dick. District Office Staff, Theory Holiday, Lori Douglas, Evie Warnicke, and Vanessa Beecroft, and our assistant principals at the junior high, Darcy Healy, and at the high school, David Nicholas and Ashley Robertson. And at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to our superintendent, Mr. Chad Housley. Thank you for joining us today for this, this luncheon, our fourth annual State of the District Address. I, I really appreciate, the, the, really what this is about is all the production, all the food, all the, all the performances um, were all created by our students. And uh, we're very, very grateful to have such talented people um, and talented people giving them the instruction. And uh, every year I'm just, I'm amazed at what they do to help make this, this come off. This part of it that I get to participate in, that's the easy part. Um, this will also be uh, made available uh, through YouTube and, and it'll be on our website and, and so that others in the community can, can view this. What I wanna do today is just real, real briefly go over some things that have been happening around the district. We're, we're really, really excited about the, the good things that are happening. Um, but I wanna start off talking about our five-year strategic plan. Last year in this meeting, we talked about engaging in a five-year strategic plan, and we took that on at the end of last year, and we had several committees looking into where are we gonna go in the next five years. So I wanna just give you a, a high-level overview of what came from those committees and, and the directions that we're taking already this, uh, this year. All right, that's as far as it'll go before it falls over. <clears throat> I want to give you just an idea of, 
of a vision statement that was created by the, um, the committee that was over the part of mission and vision. And in part of the vision statement, achieving excellence together, I want to spend just a second talking about what that means, achieving excellence together. Um, we, as a school district, are part of a, a larger community. And together really means that. Imagine, if you will, for a minute, a, a school system and a community that come together for the one purpose of educating our children and bringing all the resources to bear that we can to help educate those children. What effect would it have in 10 years, maybe 15 years, or even 20 years on, the, on, our, on our community? What will it do for us as we, we continue to utilize those resources in a unified manner to, to come together to achieve excellence for our students in our community. So achieving excellence together, it's really not a, a solo, solo experience. It's something that we have to join together in creating an environment. As a, as a mission statement, um, we have a, a current mission statement. This is a, a mission statement separate from that. Students and staff in Sholo Unified School District aspire to maximize their potential in the classroom, in extracurricular activities, and in the community. If you think about what that says, and then think about what just happened around you with our students, uh, I think we see students all the time that are aspiring to, to be excellent in everything they do, whether it's extracurricular activities. You see them out in the community. You see them um, everywhere around us, and our staff have that, that same thing happen. So I think it really reflects what's happening and, and where, we're, where we're going. So why do we exist? Why, why, do, why does a school district exist? And perhaps the easy answer is it's because we educate kids and they need an education. Um, that's fair, but there are other reasons why, why we exist. Obviously to educate, to develop and nurture students. That's one of our primary reasons of even being in existence to create a culture that is empathetic and kind. This earlier this year, we, we initiated an effort to increase empathy and kindness throughout our district and hopefully had an influence on the community and, and those around us. Uh, we invited in um, Dr. Borba to, uh, which is a, a national speaker on empathy and uh, launched us into a new school year. Uh, we had Mayor Seymour talk to us about kindness in our, in our launch of the, of the new school year and really put us in a, a good path moving forward. One of our purposes is to create a culture that that's important in, to promote excellence throughout the school community. Um, and, and I think that speaks for itself. In all that we do, we want to create a, an environment of excellence, to provide a well-rounded education with a variety of learning opportunities. Oftentimes, school districts become very narrow in their focus, and we want to make sure that we are providing a well-rounded, that's awesome, a real well-rounded opportunity for our students, and then to provide a safe and nurturing environment where uh, kids can, can flourish and where staff can feel safe coming to, to work. That's why we, why we exist. So what do, we, what do we believe? In the core of what we do, what do we really believe? And uh, the committee came up with that we are, we are kind and empathetic and kind. That's who we want to be. That's where we strive to be. Um, in our day-to-day -day operations, that's where we're striving to be. Are we perfect in our efforts to this point? We're getting there. But certainly it's a mindset and it's an opportunity to think about where we want to be. We build hope in each other. If we don't have hope, then what do we have? And I think that's a key factor of, of what we believe. We believe that each of us need to have hope, and we will have hope in one another. We are committed to achieving excellence in ourselves and, and those around us. It's a group effort. We've all heard the statement that it takes a community, right? It takes a community to do, to do great things. That goes with the adults, with the students, with the, the young children, with the community members around us. We feel like it's important that we help to build that around us. Our schools are the keystone of our community. Oftentimes when someone moves into the community, they look at what, what the city offers as far as resources and opportunity for them, but then they also turn and ask, 
What is it that the school district offers? What kind of education is afforded my child? And we, we really feel like we're the, the keystone of that, of that piece. We hold that piece and we need to be good at it. And so we're striving to make those efforts. Our five-year strategic plan, these are things that are incorporated in the strategic plan. Um, and I wanted to, to make sure that we share these because these things are currently um, in the process of being worked through. Um, the K-5, uh, our elementary group met and they started to explore some of the things that are uh, our needs and, and how we want to develop what we're currently doing into something really special. And we found that we had some gaps um, in the, especially early elementary. One of our gaps was a systematic approach to teaching reading. We were teaching reading, we were doing a, a fair job at it, but we felt like there were things that we could do to improve. That committee met and established that as one of our main priorities for this school year. Currently our K-5 principals are working with their staff to evaluate um, programs and options to bring that to pass. They're right on track. Our goal in the strategic plan was to, to evaluate and to um, look at different program options um, in the 2019-20 school year, and that's exactly what's happening right now. They're in the op they're, they're reviewing. They've had um, vendors come on, on board. Their staff are reviewing it. They've had a lot of really good conversations. And so that implementation should be right on track for the uh, year two, 2021 um, school year. Provide teachers with foundational training in reading instruction. That was important to us. Um, there are teachers that are fantastic at teaching reading, but it is an art. And it's a it's very, very difficult skill. But unfortunately, in most undergrad programs, an elementary teacher, for example, might get one or two courses in the methods of teaching reading um, when there's a lot more to the science. And so we felt like providing teachers with a foundational training in reading instruction is important to us. And at, at this point in the school year, we've ran a number of, of classes through our professional learning institute in which we've brought teachers out of the classroom and have given them teaching and teaching reading effectively, which is um, an approach to those fundamental skills that they need. On the secondary level, some things that were really important, transitions, not only transitions from fifth grade to sixth grade, but transitions from eighth grade to to their freshman year and then transitions from high school into post-secondary. Um, the secondary team has been working uh, pretty hard on, on finding out what those transitions look like, how to uh, bring more of a focus on, on career and college readiness and those transition to those pieces. Increased pathways to college and career um, was, a, was a focus. At the high school, currently we have a number of options. A student could attend Sholo High School and go through 9 through 12 as a traditional student, just like a normal high school student would want to go. In their junior year, they have a large variety of options now for dual enrollment, which we've had for a, a number of years. And our juniors take advantage of that pretty heavily. We also implemented this school year um, what we call early college. Um, a student could be in their senior year. They can take one high school course and the remainder of their day is with MPC. And they're, they're still a high school student, but they're living the life of a college student. Uh, we piloted that program this year with 25 students and look to expand that in the, in the upcoming years. We've also um, looked at our career pathways. Those are, have always been great. You've seen some of those in action today. Then we, we took a, our alternative pathway, a student that maybe has an alternative situation in their lives that means that they can't go to school eight to three, Monday through Friday, and they need a different option to get them to where they need to, ultimately to graduation. Our White Mountain Institute, we've had in place for quite a, year, quite a long time. We've rebranded that. They are now the White Mountain Institute Mavericks. It was student driven. They, they picked the name, they picked the mascot, they got everything together. Um, they really bought into that. Currently, we serve 50 students in the White Mountain Institute um, physical location and 50 students in the White Mountain Institute online offering. Um, so 100 students last year, we served 10 um, in both of those offerings together. 
Um, that has been significant for us. Um, the students are, are making great progress and we, they had their first graduation in December with 10 students. And they will have their second graduation with about 20 to 25 students in May. Um, that's a really exciting pathway. And then character education was a, was a piece that was a focus of secondary, um, of the secondary group. And um, we're right in line, the junior high is looking at the PBIS model uh, moving forward into next year and the high school has implemented some things um, this year um, through, their, through digital media to help bring character education into the school. Maintenance and transportation. Um, one of the things that was discussed in maintenance and transportation is if you remember four years ago, our capital budget um, on the state level was reduced by 85%. During the recession, it, it got to that point. So we had about $250,000-ish um, in capital budget. You reflect that out over 10 years, that means there were some, some areas of deficiencies, right? From buildings to buses, which fortunately through our bond has been able to remediate some of those issues um, and continue to remediate those issues. But then we also had things like our tractors to mow the, mow the fields and uh, to take care of those. You spent more time in the shop than you were on the grass cutting the, the actual grass. So um, one thing we have to do is address failing equipment, set aside budget capacity to provide for bus rotations. We were fortunate to increase our bus fleet. Now we've got to continue to renew and refresh those, those older ones that we kept on board. And provide budget for maintenance and uh, for playing surfaces whether that is uh, football field, soccer field, baseball and softball fields, or it's playgrounds. Um, our playgrounds are, um, they've seen better years, let's put it that way. So um, they, need to, they need to have some focus on there and that was one of the priorities of the five-year strategic plan. Overall, we're right on, on pace with that first year and, and the guidance that was given by the committees for implementation of that five-year strategic plan. There are other components that we're, we're working on and we'll, we'll actually roll that out. Um, it's, a, it's a living document, so every year the goals change. Every year there's pieces that change as far as the demographics of the school, the financials of the school, those things all change every year. We're, we're working on getting that published so that everyone will have access to that. I wanna talk just briefly about student achievement. We've, we've taken on an initiative, the board and, and I, taken on an initiative to look at different calendars for the upcoming school year and we've we've gotten a lot of feedback for, from that and we really appreciate that from the community one one bit of feedback that we've that was a thread is questions about student achievement and uh, I want to share just uh, some high level things to tell you how we're doing and to kind of get a feel of are we making any progress are things better than they were four years ago as far as academic achievement um, in high school, um, I just want to point out just a couple graphs here, and I know maybe they're, they're hard to see, but what you see on these, reflected on these graphs are three different things. Proficient students, highly proficient students, and then the percent passing. On the far left, you'll see that that's where it was in 2016. On the far right is where it was after the AZ merit tests um, this last spring. Um, so we had the percentage of passing students in, in ninth grade English four years ago was just over 30% at about 31% of the students who were proficient and highly proficient. I'd like to see a couple of things when I look at graphs, especially these graphs. Are we somewhere, are our proficient students and highly proficient students increasing and where are we all overall? Currently after this last test, we were just uh, just under, barely under 40%. So we've made some incremental growth. We are growing. I'd like to see that our highly proficient, those that are masters of the content, is also increasing. And we're, we're now pushing over um, 12%. In 10th grade, the, the top line up here, that's a line that you want to see decreasing. Those are students that are minimally proficient in the standards. And so if you see two things happen, if the minimally proficient decrease and the highly proficient increase, 
a lot of good things are they're happening, and that's what you <coughs> excuse, excuse me what you see in this graph. Um, you'll notice from 2016 to current trends, we've been in just above 20 percent. We're now uh, pushing in the 50 percent or 40 uh, high 40 percents, and the others we're seeing good growth. Um, 11th grade English is the last. There isn't a senior English portion of the assessment. And so you, you'll notice the, the same thing. We had a significant dip and then a significant increase, um, about 20, 22% increase over the last two years um, as far as the number of students pass or passing the AZ merit score um, test. Algebra, this is pretty significant. The junior high algebra four-year trend is, is pretty impressive. This scale is 100%, so it's not deceiving. That is 100% at the top. The percent passing um, is about 97%. That's junior high algebra one students that are taking that a year early. Um, that's pretty significant. Down here, this red line, that's the students that are minimally proficient in algebra um, in eighth grade. Now, not all eighth grade students take algebra, but the ones that do, we're so showing significant trends of improvement, and, and we're really excited about that. Uh, prior to 2016, we were below 75%, so almost a 25% increase in, over the, the course of three years. Four-year trends for, um, for high school algebra one, we were down, in, we had about 13% of the high school students, which are mostly freshmen, um, at proficiency level in 2016 in Algebra 1. Currently, we're over 33%. Um, so again, more than 20% growth in, in over the last three years, which is significant. Uh, mind you, our goal has been 10% growth each year. And so we're right on track for where we need to be. Geometry. Um, 2017 is an, is an anomaly in the data. There wasn't geometry offered at the high school in 2017, so no one tested. Therefore, <laughs> it drops. It's not that we didn't have anyone do anything. Um, it just dropped off. But we, went, we started here at about 20, 25%, and we're pushing 40% now um, as far as proficient students in 2018. And we just t dipped off just a little bit there in 2019, uh, probably about 2%. Algebra 2, our four-year trends from 20, 21%, now we're up to 49% as far as Algebra 2 students. Algebra, success in Algebra 2 is one of the, the greatest predictors for college success. And so that's really important to us to make sure that our students are becoming proficient in Algebra 2. Quarter two benchmarks happen right in the middle of the year. They're a good reflector of what might happen um, moving forward. They're not an absolute, but they are a good reflection of what could happen. We like to see trends year to year, um, at least maintaining or improving. And I'm not gonna um, go through each of these individually, but this is Linden in math. And then language arts is on the right hand side. The yellow is um, this last December. And you'll notice that those trends in almost all categories are higher than they were. Significant over here, last year, um, the proficient students in fourth grade were about 40, almost 50%, and this year they're pushing 80%. We would like to have all those trend lines above 70, but the fact that we're moving closer than we've ever been um, since probably about 2010, 2011 is really exciting um, for what, what we have going on. Um, these are Whipple Ranch. Well, in Whipple Ranch, they only have one set of students that take benchmarks, and that's their second graders because they're K through, K through two. Second, our first quarter benchmarks and second quarter benchmarks, they just gradually get a little bit more difficult. Um, and at one point, the second graders go from having a teacher-led assessment to now they're standing by themselves doing it alone. And so, um, it's really neat to watch them as they begin to do those things on their own. And you see we're, we're, right up, we're above 75% across the board um, with those over the last three years. This is um, Nicholas Homestead. Um, again, we're pushing those trends over here in our math, 
math area. This is math and this is language arts. Um, making some, some good gains, pushing that 60% piece. Um, and Nicholas is third through fifth grade. Junior high and high school. Um, we have junior high and high school math. You'll notice those are kind of lumped together here. Um, across the board, we're, we're at or above where we needed to be, and we're right on target for the growth that we want to see as we continue forward. Um, then we look at the junior high ELA, and you'll notice that we're trending upwards as we, we continue through the three years. So things look very positive academic-wise, um, and we're, we're making the good, good strides. Labels come out every year. We like to share them. Um, they're reflective of one thing, one thing only. Uh, remember we talked about a, a well-rounded education. This doesn't tell us how good our choir is. Doesn't tell us how good our culinary arts are. Doesn't tell us how good, um, you know, that we're doing in providing athletics and extracurriculars. It doesn't say anything about that. It just strictly says academics. And uh, I, I wish they would include all of that other stuff. That would be great, but they don't. Linden in 2017 was rated a D. Um, in 2018, they bumped that up to, to a C. And last year, they were an A. Um, 90, there was only 100 points possible. They received 97.83% of the points. Um, that's significant. They were the highest performing elementary school um, in AZ Merritt in the mountains um, in northeastern Arizona. And I would, I would venture to say that it would be hard to find a school that was much higher than that. 97% is significant. Um, Nicholas Homestead, um, that's an that's a area of consistency right across the board, um, right there. Uh, they, talking to Mr. Hall, there are some things that they're doing this year that will really target and, and um, assist in continuing to have that label grow. Sholo Junior High, um, a C in 17, they're currently, well, we're a C. I'm going to share with, with everyone that we really feel that that was a result of, of a bond project that inundated that school pretty significantly for a good portion of the school year. Um, you ever try to concentrate with a jackhammer going off in the background? Um, that's what it was like almost every day last year. Um, and Sholo High School have continued to improve. They were a C in 2017 um, and a, a B in 18 and 19. And they've done some things. Part of theirs is a college and career readiness indicators and earning those points. There's 20 points that can be earned. Um, and they've made some real tweaks to help collect that data and then to, to get those points. One or two points in that college and career readiness indicator is a difference between a B and an A. Um, and so there are some things that, that do reflect out in their score as far as career and tech and, and some of the other things, but not, um, not a significant portion. Just a brief overview of our budget um, and finance. In 2018, our average teacher salary was 35634 plus our Proposition 301, uh, which is 8,720 and some change. That average teacher salary was about 44,354. Um, in 2019, um, the base salary, the average base salary went to 41,430 um, with $9,800 in 301. Remember 301 is based on tax revenues in the state, so as the economy is doing well, that's always going to be higher because tax rev collection is going to be higher. And then average compensation for 2019 was 51,251. Uh, in 2000, I'll just bring it up here. Currently, our average base salary is 43,885, um, and then Proposition three or 301 for this year was 9,257. 9, um, brings our average to 53,142 as far as teacher compensation. I have a little note down at the bottom. Uh, if you heard the governor stated the, the state address, he did say that the, the final 5% was uh, in his budget to allocate to bring that to 20 by 
uh, 20% by 2020. Um, just a side note on that, that was based off of the 20% increase isn't a rolling increase. It was based off that first year. And so in actuality, as it rolls out, it may not be a full 20% in some, some districts, but it is 20% from the 2017 or 2018 year when it was initiated. Um, so we should see those, those happening um, across the board. Um, we, we should see that with our teacher salaries. Um, fiscal year, this fiscal year, we're excited that we're con Arizona is continuing to grow economically. Um, so that means good things for Proposition 301. And there is legislation in the, in the state legislature right now that would actually increase some of that. In November, there will most likely be a ballot on the, on the measure to increase the, the sales tax from point, uh, six tenths of a sales tax to a full cent um, sales tax. And so that, that would be great news for us. And then opening up those three categories. Budget summary, we have an m and budget of just over 15 million capital budget. This year was restored, um, partially restored to, and then we had about 792,000. We had an ADM repayment of 261,000. That happens when ADM is calculated. Um, there was a, an overcalculation in 15, 16, 17. So we had to pay that back as a part of that audit. Some school districts had to get money back, which means in those three years they, they operated in deficiencies because the state didn't give them their money. And so it, it's always a give and take as far as that's concerned. Total capital in MO is just over 16,000. In grant funding, we have about 1.8 million. Uh, that includes title funding, CTE, Perkins, rural and low income, and IDEA for a total operating budget of about 18 million, uh, 346. So there's a lot of questions about the bond and where we are as far as um, bond projects, where are we moving? Currently um, on, in the works is the auditorium. Um, we have, uh, we're working on resolutions of concerns identified during an inspection in the auditorium. We've gotten those, those quotes back. Um, they're over our procurement limits. So now we, we have to go out to bid for three, uh, to get three bids. And once we get those back, we'll start working on resolving those concerns inside the auditorium, which include things to do with the flywheels and, and the, the lighting and other things, the uh, curtains. Um, ADA compliance, um, we currently have a, a um, recommendation from an architect on how to bring that up to code on AD, with ADA compliance. Um, and then painting and weatherization of the ex exterior, that's an SFB project that will probably take place closer to the summer. Campus security ca cameras in all, all schools. In transportation, we're currently looking at white fleet options for additional white fleet to our, uh, to our, our fleet. White fleet is, are the vehicles that are used for teachers, students to go uh, to trainings or off the mountain. And so we, we have a few that um, we hope come back off the mountain after they leave. But um, we're looking at that that piece there. School facilities board project, we have uh, currently in the works weatherization projects. Um, many of you saw that the uh, junior high was partially painted on the, on the street side and you're wondering, well, is that all they're gonna do? That kind of looks weird. But they had to do that before the weather came in in order to have some other projects be able to, to take off. They'll resume that as soon as the weather warms up, maybe the wind stops blowing, I don't, I don't know, but around April 1st is the target for them to start that. That includes um, at all campuses, paint and windows will be replaced um, where the windows don't meet the weatherization piece. A finalization of the gym, currently on target, we have the, the floor is being um, put in right now. Uh, they, they look to finish that by the end of March and then we're about uh, from this point about 15 weeks out on having the bleachers in. The hope is, the target, the desire is to have that gym completely ready for graduation. Um, but it would be hard to have graduation in there if the seats weren't there. So we are hopeful that the seats will be in in time. Uh, and then roofing at the junior high and other facilities um, will, will start to take place as we move forward. In total, we are um, 
we had talked about increasing our bond capacity from 10 million of bond money and then utilizing SFB funds to enhance that. Um, our target was 5 million and we're right on track with that 5 million total. In fact, the gym by itself was over 2 million. And um, it entails complete resurfacing of the floor, well, basically waterproofing the floor, putting a new floor down, which is three full gyms wide, as, as you know, and then air conditioning um, and heating, re redoing all that, that system. Um, and so we, we're really making that happen. Um, just want to bring you up to speed on a few things legislatively um, as you're, you're following and want to know how some of the legislation is affecting schools. These are just a few. There are over 100 bills that are in place that would affect education. Some of them hopefully will die before they get a signature or even consideration. Um, but uh, Senate Bill 1234, convenient that the additional assistance restoration, that would restore all of our capital funding um, this year rather than two years from now, which is significant. That would push four years ago, 250,000 in capital funding to over a million dollars, um, which will help us take care of some of those needs identified in our strategic plan. Uh, Senate Bill 2625, Civic Celebration Day. You heard this in the, perhaps in the, the governor's state, of the, uh, state address. Um, that's gotten some traction. That is, will be a day that's designated where the whole instruction for the day will be based on civics instruction. Nothing else could happen in the schools should that become law on whatever day they decide that that is. Senate Bill 1060, special education B weights. Um, when students are funded um, at a school, you get an A weight for all students. That's a certain level of funding and then you get B weights for students with special needs. And that's an additional set of money above. Um, for years they've been trying, this was, the B weight formula was uh, established in the early 80s. It's kind of antiquated, and they're trying to figure out how the, the, the school districts with a large number of special needs students, how do you help them take care of the needs that those kids have? For instance, we tap our maintenance and operation budget um, over $1 million um, to take care above of what we get to, uh, to service those special needs kids. And that's supposed to be funded with B weights well, we don't, it doesn't bring in enough money to do that. So they put 1060 in place to try to address that. It's getting traction, probably should happen, That'll, that would help, help us significantly. And then Senate, House Bill 2013, this is one of those spe special interest things that you always hear, and maybe this, this is one that there's people on different sides, but this would require and I say require because the law says shall, it would require that if a student at any grade level did not meet the standards, they would be required, teachers would be required to retain them. Not sure that we're happy about that one um, because there is some research, research that says that retention isn't always the answer. And so, uh, Currently that is in place uh, for third graders who don't pass the reading test. It just affects the bottom 15% in the state. This would mean anyone in third grade that didn't pass that test would be in third grade again. So you, you imagine what impact that might have. There's another bill out there I just want to throw out. I can't remember the number and I didn't put it up there so I apologize. There's been a push for um, individuals, uh, parents and rightfully so want to see what, um, what material is being used in the classrooms. Um, education today is much different than when you and I probably went to school. When we went to school there was a textbook and the, the board approved that textbook and then you could look through the textbook and say, oh well, that's great or that's not great or whatever. Today, today's educational environment is more open source. So a teacher might go onto a website called Teacher Pay Teacher and pull a source and use that to help their kids in their classroom. They might pull up a YouTube video that's significantly helpful and can contribute to the education of the kid in the classroom. Um, the, the law, the bill, should it pass as law, would require that all of those resources be posted on the district's website for 48 hours for parents to review and require board approval before they could be used in the classroom. So 
that would mean significant things to our teachers. A teacher goes to a, to a place, buys a book on discount and says, oh, the kids would love this book. They take it to their classroom, put it in their classroom library. That book would have to have 48 hours for review and board approval before it could be used in the classroom. So it's significant. Sometimes those are things that probably should happen, but when the bill is written, it takes it to the nth degree. And that might be one of those, those situations. I would encourage you, if you feel like you want to have a voice in any of the legislation, go to um, AZSBA, the Arizona School Board Association's website, uh, .org, backslash alias. They will sign you up into the call, call, to, call to speak. You don't have to go to the valley to, to call to speak. You can actually put in your comments. You can oppose a bill or, or back a bill from your, from your seat in your home. Um, but you can give your voice. Our legislators do look at those things. They do see where their constituents are, are feeling. And so if we can share our voice in, in cons um, towards those bills that are concerning. I do think it's going to be a fast legislative session. It's an election year. And as long as they're there, they can't campaign. So they want to get out. So we can't delay our voice if we want to share our voice. So um, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to be with us. But that is our, our current state of our district. Thank you.